Okay. Um, I like all the uh, all the moxie uh, paraphernalia <laughs> that's that's behind you everywhere. That's great. Have you been you been collecting them, or have people been sending them to you? Oh, a little bit of both. And I, one of the one of the highlights for me of all this was I got to be the grand marshal of the moxie parade up in Maine a few years ago. <laughs> I think it was 2017. So. That's so, a big thing. Tens well, of thousands of people. You know? it, it's like one of those people who, like, for some reason, likes a I don't know, like a small frog, you know, <laughs> little statue that they see in a in a market where they buy it. They take it home and they're like, oh, I like this frog. And people are like, oh, you're the frog person. So now That's everybody right. buys them a frog, and then their house just fills with frogs, and they can't get rid of them. But uh, you've got it right. But in your case, it's like obscure 1920s references to people with 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 yep. a lot of moxie. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, so who are you? What do you do? Yeah, um, I'm Michael Hecht. I am uh, currently the associate, uh, an associate director of MIT's Haystack Observatory. But more importantly for this discussion, I'm the principal investigator of the MOXIE instrument on the Mars Perseverance rover, uh, uh, more colloquially known as PERSI. Um, now you, I mean, with the Haystack Observatory, you've also been involved in the Event Horizon Telescope. So I'm sure we're going to going to be covering all of these these topics. Uh, hard for the audience and myself to sort of decide which way to go first. But let's let's start with let's start with Moxie. Now, what is the what does Moxie stand for? Moxie stands for the Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment. I'll get to ISRU in a minute. It's often bad form to embed an acronym in your acronyms. <clears throat> right. I did it for a reason because, you know, the first attempt at this did the same thing. It was something called MIP uh, with the same acronym in the middle. So think of it as a little homage. Uh, so what is ISRU? That's really the question. Uh, the Mars and the oxygen and the experiment, I think everyone gets. ISRU is a little more subtle. Um, it means in situ resource utilization. Uh, you would commonly say living off the land. I like to say that that LOL would be a better acronym, but it's already being used. <laughs> Lol. So we we had we got we got second prize. We got ISRU, um, but that's what it means. And and in the case of Mars, it's particularly important because it's a long way to go. It's a heavy lift off of Earth to get things to Mars and. Astronauts are going to be there for a long time when they go. It's just the way the planets line up. Uh, typically, you know, a year and a half type stay is, is what people talk about. And um, so with that amount of time on the surface, you need a lot of stuff. Okay. And uh, if you can knock down the amount of stuff you need to bring, it's more likely this mission is going to happen and soon and be successful. It turns out the biggest chunk of stuff you need, the single biggest, isn't obvious, but it turns out to be oxygen, not so much to breathe. You know, that's, you, you need that, of course, that's critical, but you only need maybe a ton and a half of that, you know, for a mission of, of, of a crew of four. But what you need most of it for is so the crew can get back off the surface and head back to Earth, because just like people, rockets have to breathe. And they breathe oxygen. So, you know, it's not like in a car, you put gas in the tank and you get the oxygen for free from the air and a rocket, you have to bring it along and it's heavy. It's a lot heavier than the fuel. So we can save 27 tons by making that fuel, or maybe 25 tons by making that fuel on Mars, or not that fuel, that oxygen for the fuel on Mars, instead of bringing it all the way from earth. And with, perseverance where is it finding this this oxygen well that's the the great thing this is really low-hanging fruit you know on earth um, plants trees all make oxygen out of carbon dioxide uh, they also at the same time take in water and they put out you know carbohydrates or fruit things like that but they've served that function for us of, of pulling the carbon dioxide out of the air and putting oxygen back into the air, which is why we shouldn't be cutting down so many trees. Um, on Mars, you have a lot more carbon dioxide to work with than we do on Earth, maybe 25 times more. Hmm. But that's all there is. That's right. all there is. Okay? That's interesting. Not, no, hardly no oxygen to speak of, maybe a couple of percent nitrogen in the atmosphere. So almost none, but a lot of carbon dioxide. So all told, this is really thin air. This is a hundred times 
maybe 200 times thinner than the air on Earth. So we're literally making oxygen out of thin air, okay? mm -hmm. <laughs> quite literally. But, um, but but that is interesting that that the atmospheric pressure on Mars is 1%, half percent than it is on Earth, and yet it's mm -hmm. all carbon dioxide. And so you've got mountains more carbon dioxide to work with than we have here on Earth. And so that process is actually more efficient on Mars it than it is on Earth. On yeah, Mars. it is. Now, now if we, of course, if we can bring a rainforest, that would be great. But obviously, we can't bring it and we couldn't keep it alive if we did. So we have to, you know, to, to do the job of putting, putting that rainforest, if you will, that tree in a box, a mechanical version. And this is a particularly simple one, because as I mentioned, trees also convert water into, carbo into, into carbohydrates at the same time. We're just doing the one function of turning the carbon dioxide into oxygen. And that's relevant because frankly, if we built this box on earth for use on earth, we would do both. Uh, we, would, we, would take, we would convert water and carbon dioxide at the same time, we'd get out oxygen and we'd get out some kind of a, another fuel. You know, people use do syngas, uh, what's called syngas, for example. But we only have the CO2 on Mars. Water is available on Mars in the form of ice, but um, it's like a mineral. You have to go get it. You have to find it. You have to dig it up. You have to carry it. You have to melt, in this case, melt it. You have to purify it. Um, and that's not easy to do robotically. And it's probably expensive to do and the equipment to do it probably outweighs literally outweighs the benefit because the benefit is in weight in the end uh, that we don't have to bring to mars so the low-hanging fruit the thing you can do with a small machine that doesn't have to go anywhere is that one function of the tree <laughs> okay moxie is in fact like a modest sized tree in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide it will turn into oxygen um, to, do, to support this human mission that we're looking forward to uh, is going to take the equivalent of 200 trees, not just one. <laughs> and right. it's going to have to run for uh, about an Earth year to fill up that oxygen tank before the crew even departs Earth. So we're making a little scale model. And what is the chemical... I guess, what is the chemical formula that's going on here that's actually, you mm -hmm. know, input carbon dioxide, output oxygen, in between what's going on that's actually producing it? Yeah, it's pretty simple. Carbon dioxide is one carbon and two oxygens, you know, dioxide. Uh, that's the molecule. You can do two things with it, you know, just with this electrochemistry without introducing anything else. You can pull off O2 and leave carbon or you can pull off one oxygen atom and leave CO, which is carbon monoxide. That's what we do. We work very hard to do that and not pull off both. Because if you pull off both, all right, then you're left with carbon, which is essentially, there's no good way to get it out of the machine. Um, and it gums it up and everything <laughs> stops working. Right. CO, carbon monoxide, you know, we don't want it in our basements but it's otherwise kind of a harmless gas that can either escape or we can actually save it to uh, react it as fuel sometime uh, for some other purpose. So we go CO2, you know, the arrow goes to CO plus O, or more practically two, so we take two CO2 molecules, two CO2s go to two COs plus NO2 molecule. And how energy intensive is this process? It's very energy intensive and MOXIE in particular, the small scale model is really energy inefficient. And that's just a function of scale. We have to bring a lot of stuff with us to make this tiny little thing work. Uh, so we expect that, you know, on a full scale version, you know, uh, maybe half the power goes into the actual like electrolysis. Right now it's maybe a tenth, okay, that goes into the chemistry of pulling these CO2 uh, molecules apart um, so what's the rest of it? Well, a lot of it is the compressor that mm. brings in the CO2 and compresses it to something we can work with because it's, as I said, it's a very thin air. You've still got to collect it and you've got to, to push it through this little machine. Um, and a good part of it is uh, just heaters. You have to, this particular reaction, this particular tool, this electrolysis unit, requires a, a special ceramic heater to 800 degrees centigrade. Now with a big system, you can insulate it really well. That costs you very little power. With our little system, we're limited. 
uh, you know, so you lose heat in various places. And that turns out to be, uh, you know, maybe as much as 100 watts that we lose mm. in the process when we're using maybe, you know, 20 watts or so for the actual chemical reaction. And then you add that to the compressor. And before you know it, you know, you've got 300 watts to do 30 watts of work. But uh, we expect in the future to, in the next version, the large version, to do more like 50%, 40, 40, 50% efficiency. And so once Perseverance arrived on Mars, it got to work uh, mm -hmm. deploying helicopters, zapping right. razor, uh, rocks with lasers, but also mm -hmm. got to work starting to make oxygen. So right. how has the, how's it going so far? Well, of course, uh, Perseverance has a lot to do. Um, there's there's seven instruments on there that need to run. There's driving to be to be done. There's a certain amount of maintenance to be done. And more importantly, the real thrust of the science instruments is to select samples for for caching, coring, and caching. So there's drilling and caching to be done, uh, and those will you know, we expect to be returned in the next decade to Earth for analysis in Earth labs. So this is an extraordinarily forward-looking mission, right? This is a mission that's doing some science today. It's bringing back samples for tomorrow. It's developing, you know, helicopter technology for, <laughs> to, for tomorrow. And then it's looking at how to expedite human exploration the day after that. Um, so it's a very busy mission. And we, as you alluded to, we use a lot of power. Okay, we use, uh, in the course of a MOXIE run, we spent a couple of hours just heating the system up, not doing anything. And then we start making oxygen for about an hour. And in the end, if you add that to the the power that the rover is using just to, you know, what we call stay awake during that time, we've used something like a thousand watt hours, which is really the whole allocation for the day you know, for the <laughs> instruments, for the payload. So everyone else takes a break, literally. Oh, it's a MOXIE day. We get a day off, we can do the laundry, whatever, you know, yeah. whatever all these other people do who are working seven days a week. And um, we take the whole day. So naturally, we can't do this real often. And that's to make oxygen for an hour. So we have had our first oxygen run. Um, and then we do a, you know some other diagnostic things in between. And then we'll have our next run, we anticipate... Um, well, actually, we just had our, our our next run. Our second run is is happening imminently, mm. okay, very very soon, um, in the next days, and then we get our um, uh, the next run. We're looking at around Memorial Day. So you know, right now they're coming once every few weeks, but it, we'll settle down into a cadence probably of a scheduled run every couple of months and. Anytime there's a spare day that nothing else is going on in the rover, and that actually happens, well, we're there. We're ready. We're ready to roll. <laughs> right, so. right. And so, how much? So, with that first run, how much oxygen did you make? <clears throat> we made between five and six grams of oxygen. <clears throat> it's not a whole lot. It's what an astronaut, you know, doing normal activities uh, would use up in about ten minutes. Right. Right. So, um, you know, one small breath for a human. Um, and on how many hours? How many hours of operation the whole day? Well, no, no. We use the day's worth of power. We produce oxygen for about an hour. Now we can do it at a higher rate than that. We can we right. can do it at um, our next run. We're going to show eight grams an hour. Okay, we average just under six for the first run. We're being careful, uh, but at that point we can't do a lot better because this rover has a very minimal power supply you know it's it's runs off of about 110 watts and i you know it, it used to be it was really easy for us to to know what that meant because we all had these incandescent light bulbs and right. we know 110 right. watt by us well, from what's on your desk and that runs the whole rover um uh, so we can't that that's why we're only making you know six eight maybe someday 10 grams an hour <clears throat> Uh, we're not limited so much by the size of the system. We could make more, but we're limited by the power available to us. And so with the existing hardware, I mean, if you did have unlimited amounts of power, 
what do you think would be like the maximum amount? I mean, where I guess I'm getting at is could a desperate astronaut, you know, in some future The Martian movie, Mark Watney makes his way across yeah. the landscape to get to Perseverance, hooks up his much more powerful uh, power source to be able to get enough oxygen to breathe. Could you, by jamming a mountain of power through Moxie, get enough to keep an astronaut alive? Yeah, and it wouldn't be a mountain. It would, it would again, be probably, um, but this runs off a battery, so it would be under a kilowatt. But, yes, you could do much better with this system, enough to keep alive. Um, now, the funny thing is, though, it would be even better if you, if you then fired up Perseverance and drove it to a more reasonable location on the planet, because right now we're at quite high altitude, hmm. which means – that like like on Earth, you go to higher altitude, the air gets even thinner. Okay, so we're dealing with even thinner air than we would if we were at the location of the uh, you know, of, of even Curiosity or the uh, in Mars Exploration Rovers or a Pathfinder or a Viking. You know, but this is this is much higher in elevation than any of those flew to. Uh, so we so the air is even thinner than it needs to be. Once you've done a few more rounds and really proven that the the technology fulfills all of the calculations all of the all of the simulations that you've done in in you know pretend mars here here on earth mm -hmm. will there be anything else to do or or will you at a certain point shut down the experiment and call it a day and let and give the power back to the to the rest of the instruments <laughs> no i hope we won't call it a day until we just can't go anymore you know just like the rover there are many things to do now some of them one of the things is simply uh, to show how long this instrument can live and how mm. many hours it can run um, in what kind of range of environments. So there really is a difference. If nothing else is a difference in the air, you know, the density, the thickness of the air with seasons, with night, with day. So we at least want to go through a Martian year uh, through that whole cycle. But there's also, uh, you know, we're learning. We're learning how to run this. And we learn first in the lab, and then we try at Mars. Um, it needs, uh, I think, a lot of, it, it needs to be a lot smarter. You know, I think for me, that's a big lesson learned uh, as to what has to happen in the next generation. But we can make moves in that direction with the current system, maybe even updating the software at some point. Uh, right now, it's, uh, you know, the, the issue I described earlier of only plucking off one atom from the molecule and not, not, uh, uh, not both of them. That requires a lot of tuning and guess, and a little bit of guesswork. And we can really use the information we've got on the instrument better than we're using it now to prevent us from getting into trouble. Oh, and so when you say that you're, you know, it requires some guesswork. Like if you push it too hard in the wrong way, then you do end up with that carbon soot. So you're like not being as efficient as you could be because you don't want to clog up the machine. Exactly. And yeah. I think that there are two big uncertainties, um, two of the two biggest uncertainties. One, in fact, is the weather, <laughs> is the density of the air. It's not quite predictable and reproducible from day to day. It follows a pattern more, more regularly than Earth does. Uh, but on the other hand, it changes more over the course of a day than, than on Earth. Um, you know, the pressure can change, the, the temperature can change by, you know, up to 70, 80 degrees centigrade. And that's a lot over the course of a day. And the pressure itself changes from day to night by as much as 10%. That's a lot on Earth. Um, and over the course of the year, maybe by 30% from season to season. So all told, the density, of course, across the year can change by a factor of two. So we need to know that very well. That's one factor. And the other is we actually need to know the, the, the status of the instrument itself. You know, if, if I can get a little more kind of into an electrical analogy, uh, we're putting current through a resistor. And so there's a very simple relationship, Ohm's law, between the current and the voltage and the resistance of a resistor, you know, uh, V equals IR, it's Ohm's law. The same is true here, but the resistance of this instrument slowly changes over time. And what gets us in trouble is too high a voltage and what we're controlling is the current. Okay, so if you follow that, if we, if we set the current too aggressively for a certain amount of air density, that's when we get into trouble. So we need to 
do our best guess at both those things, at the resistance of the instrument, which changes, and the density of the air, which changes. So, um, you know, we have to be cautious as a result of those two uncertainties. And and it does feel to me like, like the future missions to Mars, because it's such a, a giant mass savings, that you're going to really depend on this instrument doing its job properly, you know, because you can't just call your your small appliance repair to have them come and fix the compressor if it if it goes like, like right. it's you, you only get one shot at it. And so will you reach some point where you'll then try to push it out of its comfort zone and and sort of try to brick it? <laughs> I'm sure we will at some point in you know, our thinking about this mission is we're still in a phase right now where we're just spreading our spreading our wings, if you will, and then trying to work within the expected capabilities a little bit at a time. Um, the most recent thing we've been checking out is, you know, the, the rover has two microphones on it. All right. And we've tried for the first time listening to the, our compressor with wow. the microphone because you know, I remember, I, mean, I expected this answer, but the first time I walked into the laboratory with the company that was building this compressor for us, Air Squared in Colorado. And, you know, I had a question in my mind and I, I wanted to hear the answer from them. I knew what it would be. And I said, how do you know if the compressor is misbehaving, right? If it's not behaving well? And I said, well, the best way is to listen to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all have, anyone who drives a car knows that. The best way to know what's going on with your engine is to listen to it. And I say, sometimes if it's settled, we'll even put a stethoscope on it. And right then I said, we need to find a way to listen to this on Mars. And fortunately, there are two microphones on the mission. So did so. the need to listen to it, did that help make the case for a microphone on Perseverance? Because we've been waiting for a microphone on Mars for decades now, and it's just been like it's never we've never been lucky and finally there is one on on board so you didn't you didn't say that didn't help their decision making process at all no no it really didn't and, oh. and you know this is as you say this has been a long time coming we had one on polar lander which we lost we had one on phoenix which you know i was on the phoenix mission uh and um it was on there and it wasn't even that it didn't work it's that it just ran into a wall with getting everything done and the software didn't get done and you know there just wasn't the resources and manpower so we've tried actually tried gotten you know close twice <laughs> so so uh, it finally happened and it happened twice from in in two two microphones from two totally different directions uh two totally different groups yeah so you know, we're just taking advantage of yeah it. Well, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, it, it had never, I mean, you know, the hope was that we would hear wind blowing past the rover and we'd hear the crunch mm -hmm. of the rover's wheels in the landscape and so on. But to, to think of it as a really useful diagnostic tool. I mean, it's funny you're, you, you're bringing this up. Like I just had my refrigerator repaired and it was making this horrible racket and the, the service tech came in and he pulled the fridge out and he listened down where the compressor is and he was like listening and and it's like he turned off the fridge turned it back on and listened to the compressor and he says nope that's not it and then he stood up higher and then he listened again he's like oh there it is it's this valve between the top and the bottom it's way cheaper it's a hundred dollar fix not a seven hundred dollar fix you know you're lucky and it was all just done because he could, he was able to listen to it. Uh, that's really cool. Um, all right. So I guess the next step then is to think about how this method of producing oxygen, assuming everything goes fine and you're, you're able to feel like it, it works how you want. How does this scale up to the needs of future Mars exploration? I'm glad you asked, Fraser. Um, we're, we're foreseeing that the instrument will need in 10 or 15 years will weigh about a ton and it will require 25 to 30 kilowatts oh. of power. Now, so, you know, the weight, if you're going to save 25 tons, the weight is fine and we can get that there. Um, the power, you know, <laughs> obviously gave you pause yes. and, and it well, does, yeah. but, it, but it shouldn't. And here's why it shouldn't. Um, it, First of all, the astronauts in their habitat are going to need about the same amount of power. That's the main reason. We can't do this human mission without having a power 
plant that big. And so the other question is, well, now don't you need two of them, one to make oxygen and one? Well, the answer is no. Uh, the reason it's no is because at least the vision of this mission that has dominated since the days of Werner von Braun, uh, there's been studies of how to do this mission, has always been that you put all the all the necessities in place before you send the crew. And that would mean a place to live, a way to take off again, a power plant, in this case, a way to make oxygen, uh, rovers, the whole, the whole hotel is all set up, right? And, and they just show up with their toothbrush. That's been the vision and the planets limit how you can do that. So the, the energy efficient way to do that you could learn just by looking up in the sky every night for a couple of years and seeing the cycle of Mars in the sky, and it gets bright every 26 months. Okay, it, it's just obvious to the naked eye, and that represents when Earth and Mars cross in their orbits. So that is the cycle. You know that that cycle is known to the ancients and was part of astrology. Is the cycle that we send things to Mars on every 26 months? So you send all the the stuff, the base to Mars on one cycle, and it takes maybe six months to get there or seven months. And now you have, you know, close to 20 months to get everything ready before the astronauts take off. Okay. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to wait till they're halfway to Mars to learn that, oh, we didn't get there, right? So you take off the usual margins and you, you aim for about a year, maybe 14 months to get everything ready. And so that's how much time we have to fill up this oxygen tank for the rocket. It has to be a you know zero loss tank, which is a also a challenging technology, but doable. And that's the scale we're determining. But the point is, we're bringing the power plant there, you know, 20, 20 months in advance before the astronauts take off. We're bringing the ISRU system. We use that twenty months to make oxygen. We give we we kind of break in the power plant. We make sure it's working, it's going to last, it's robust. And so by the time the astronauts arrive, they have their power system, they have their oxygen, everything ready to go. So it it meshes, it, it fits from a system point of view. It's a very balanced design. And, right. Uh, and that's, that's, that's satisfying. Yeah. And you, you said that the sort of the key is going to be oxygen, but but you did you did miss the first three most important things on the list, which are power, power and power. Uh, right. <laughs> um, and and so I mean, that's the that's the kilopower. I mean, I know NASA has got this plan for a compact uh, fission reactor that could generate that kind of, of energy. That's been NASA's thinking for some time. And, uh, you know, there's there are documents that come out from time to time called design reference architectures. The latest is version 5.0. I understand version 6 is in progress. It used to be called the design reference mission, same document. And that has focused on fission reaction for a while, also mentioning, yeah, you could do this with solar and batteries, but it would be really hard mm -hmm. and really big. Uh, the fission reactors are you know, we could get into a long discussion about the relative safety, if you will, of what we do now with the radioisotope thermoelectric generators, like on Perseverance versus a fission reactor. Um, and, you know, there are pros and cons to both. They probably unbalance equally safe. And the fission reactor produces, you know, 10, 20, 30 times more power. Um, you know, then, you know, uh, the, well, no, I'm talking about a uh, um, hundred times more. Yeah, power, yeah I think they're like, hundred times more power, three hundred times more. Yeah, power. I think they're one instead is of a hundred watts. We're talking about two hundred well, kilowatts. The, the one they the one they tested the one they tested was one kilowatt. Yeah. Okay, but that was to test. A, you know, it's like Moxie to test a small version. So we would assume that the final versions will be maybe ten kilowatts each. Yeah. And you put three of them on the surface for redundancy. And uh, then we do the same for Moxie, by the way, for this full scale system that needs to make two or three kilograms an hour for a year. So you probably build it to make, you know, build it modular to make one and you put, you know, three of them, right. three systems on the surface. 
it, it's interesting. It sort of nicely lines up with about the amount of energy that we use for a regular household. Like most people in their house are using about 30 kilowatts of energy mm -hmm. a month. Um, mm -hmm. And so to sort of imagine a kilowatt hours. And so you sort of imagine how much comparatively, you know, to have those three reactors rolling would be uh, would be fine to power your house, you could hook those up to your to your house, no problem. Um, yeah. uh, so then that's sort of like the the first step, you know, to, if you sort of imagine the mass budget of what you're going to have to take from Earth, oxygen for breathing for for propellant for water for growing things, all kinds of reasons why you'd want oxygen on board. Let's say, and it's really nice and convenient, that comes right out of the atmosphere. Let's say you get that squared away. Mm -hmm. If you wanted some other resource done ISRU style, what do you think would be the next thing to try to sort out? There are two possibilities. I think almost anybody in the field asked that question would say, would immediately say water. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want, if you have water, and you have CO2, you can make almost anything. You, know, you can make beer. I mean, you can make <laughs> almost anything you want. Yeah. Um, and the water is a matter of going to the right place. We know that if you go above, say, um, you know, people will argue about the actual boundary, but somewhere around 45 north latitude is more accessible. You could do it south latitude, but poleward. You know, if you go colder, if you go to the poles, you can find get into a permafrost zone, much like you know the tundra up you know in Siberia or you know or, uh, northern Alaska. You get into a permafrost zone, where if you brush away two or three centimeters of dust, literally, Phoenix mission you know was was there, went there, you have ice as far as the eye can see, and mm -hmm. that's your easiest water source. Now there are others, uh, you know, deep below the ground at lower lower latitudes. Uh, I think that's impractical to actually use those although NASA's big at busy surveying them there's a certain amount of water just in the soil all over mars and it's you know a few percent you know a few to several percent so you could build a kiln if you will and and drive the water off of the soil and shovel soil you know wet soil in one end if you like and dry soil out the other and extract the water i think that would be painful uh, in terms of resources myself, um, but you could do that. So I think water is is the next, is the magic one, but it requires work. There's another sleeper. There's a sleeper in there, and that's particularly meaningful to me because I was involved in its discovery, and that's perchlorate. Mm -hmm. okay, it turns out perchlorate makes up to almost a percent, between half a percent and a percent of just the soil, the, the powder, the, the dust on Mars, um, kind of the amount that of chloride that you'd expect to see, salts, uh, sodium chloride. That's what you expect to see. And instead on Mars, you get mostly perchlorate instead of chloride. It's another relatively stable form of chlorine. You know, so you might get magnesium chlorate where on earth you'd get magnesium chloride the difference is it's cl is chlorine you get clo4 instead of just cl right. so where you might have you know nacl you might have na you know 2, two clo4 um on mars and as you can imagine you know that perchlorate at some level wants to turn back to chlorine and so when you heat it up to about 200 centigrade or so, it will ultimately spontaneously combust. And um, we use that for things like airbags and fireworks and oxygen candles in the, you know, in, 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 in human space travel. So we use that characteristic. It's very real. It gives you a lot of energy and a lot of oxygen. But you can also use it in reaction with a fuel. And the fuel is usually something simple like, you know, a powdered aluminum, or something like that. And that's how you make solid rocket solid rocket boosters <laughs> with ammonium perchlorate, and uh, and I believe they use uh, aluminum filings hmm. or something for for a fuel. So there's there's everywhere. It's it's like the ox the air. Anywhere you take pick up a handful of soil, you're going to have half a percentage of perchlorate. It's also um, 
ridiculously soluble in water. It's kind of, you know, the comparable thing we see in our everyday experience might be caffeine. You know, you throw coffee beans in water, the caffeine comes out before anything else does, right? Um, and uh, perchlorate is just super, super soluble in water. So once you have some water, you can, you know, basically wet the soil, catch the water coming out, you know, evaporate it off, and you've got pure perchlorate left behind, and you then recover the water, of course. Um, so it's fairly easy to recover and concentrate, and you could then use it for fuel or, um, you know, or for rocket boosters or as an oxygen source. Huh. So. That, that's excited. really interesting. It's yeah. funny. Whenever I talk about Mars, there's always somebody in the comments or whatever who will say, you yeah, know, but what about those poisonous, poisonous perchlorates? Like, how are we ever going to deal with them? And what you're saying yeah. is, what about those valuable, valuable, wonderful perchlorates? That's how right. are, are we going to be able to find enough of them to, to do all of the wonderful things that we want to do with them? So if you are able to pull off these these perchlorates and you've got the oxygen that you've been making mm -hmm. as you say that's a mm -hmm. solid rocket booster you no longer need to try and find a source of of hydrogen for your methane for your or for your hydrogen as a as a as the other part of the fuel yeah. of the propellant there are so many things you can make with hydrogen uh, I don't, I think that needs to be on the top three list. Yes. I, I am suggesting that the combination of availability, if, if we keep insisting on going to, you know, to equatorial regions, you know, to tropical climates, if you will, yeah. um, uh, then we really might look at perchlorate as second on the list. If, if someone decides to, to say, let's put practicality of human exploration first, um, and let's go to higher latitudes, you know, then you might put water next on the list. Uh, but that's my opinion. And, and to be honest, uh, you might find a handful of people around the planet who share that. The general consensus will be go for the water, go for the methane. It's a tried and true process. We know how to make the methane. Uh, we know how to make other things out of it. And heck, you need water anyway. Right. And so do you think that I mean, it, it, the, they're sort of at cross purposes, like for the the nicer atmosphere, for the warmer climates, for the easier easier operation, for the uh, y you know for the longer days, et cetera. You may want to be closer to the equator, but for access to water, you're going to want to be closer to the poles. Which way do you think that that landing site argument will? in the end, like, is there any, I mean, apart from really awful cold temperatures, is there any other downside to going to the, and I guess lower solar panel, is there any real downside to going to closer to the poles than to the equators? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I would think almost, uh, almost uh, argue with, with every, every point you just made, but, but it's absolutely common wisdom, not just common wisdom, but including most scientists, most engineers who really haven't stopped to think about it. Okay, so let me make two cases. First of all, let me explain why there's a focus on the equator. And it isn't really because, you know, for the reason that we go to the Bahamas. It's really, it's, it's, it's really driven by a, a dominant science interest in Mars geological history, or Mars history, if you will, over the course of the, 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 uh, the, the billions of years, the four and a half billion years of the planet's existence. And there are other people, myself included, who are in, a, in smaller communities who say, hey, we're really interested in modern Mars and how it changes and, you know, the interplay of ice and atmosphere and climate change and all those good things. That community, our small community, would actually rather go to the poles, mm -hmm. but we're not driving the bus right now. Right. And to a geologist, you look at this planet and you see what you would never see on Earth. You see billions of years of history just you know, visible to your naked eye from orbit, it's so obvious. You try to find something on Earth that's three billion years old, you've really got to, you know, turn over some rocks to find it because we have tectonics, we have weather, we have erosion, we have oceans, we have geology, all sorts of things that wipe out that record that Mars doesn't have. So that's a huge appeal to geologists, and that's the real driver. Now, suppose you landed instead on the North Pole, okay, right on the North Pole, the very pole. 
Okay, and let's say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the first thing you might say is it's cold. It's one of my favorite subjects is explaining what cold means, okay? It sounds kind of dull and pedantic, but it's not. When we say it's cold as human beings living on earth in, in soup, okay, in atmospheric soup, in a really thick atmosphere, if you were a Martian looking at how we live, you would look at us like fish swimming in the sea. All right, the temperature of a fish is going to be the temperature of the water because it's hard to avoid. And with us, our temperature is the temp or the temperature we feel is the temperature of the air because there's so much of it. Now, if you're an astronaut in space, that has no meaning. You're, you're in vacuum and you're hot when the sun's shining on you and you're cold when you're in the shade. Um, a place like Mars with thin atmosphere is somewhere in between but it's mostly it's more like space than hmm. like earth okay so whether you're warm or cold depends a lot more on whether you're in the sun or in the shade than just how cold the air is and i think most astronauts experience is that more often than not they're hot and they need air conditioning okay than than being cold um i like to say if you were walking around on mars you would use an umbrella to to keep yourself warm not to keep the sun off you from keeping you to keep you cool like we do on Earth. And that's because the sky is so darn cold that from a radiation balance point of view, it sucks your heat out. Hmm. The sky would suck your heat out. That's what it would feel like. You know, we all know that feeling if you're near a cold window, you feel kind of a chill. Yeah. You now, but imagine being surrounded by this really cold sky that was just pulling the heat out of your body. So that's more what Mars is like. Okay, so. Ignore temperature and then ask a more practical question that would occur to say thermal engineers, uh, or just people trying to make instruments work. What is it that makes instruments break? It's not high and low temperatures, it's temperature change. Okay, it's when every day the temperature drops by 80 degrees and this instrument to some extent will follow it to some extent given enough hours, you know, it will cool down and then it gets warm again. And that cycling is just murder mm. on mechanisms, even on electronics. If you're on the actual pole, just like the pole of earth, you get one day a year, right? right you get right, one right. thermal cycle a year. So thermally, I, I argue it's the most benign place on the planet, not That's the most hostile. Huh, okay. So, so uh, that's just one one idea. I mean, yeah. I can talk to you about all kinds of other virtues of the pole. Certainly, the fact that there's ice everywhere. Yes. So you have all the water you want. Right. But then that means the need to split up to pull the, your oxygen out of the atmosphere becomes less important because you can get it through through the water. So you you that's just talk, probably true. You just talk you know, yourself I mean, out of a job, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, maybe so, and that's probably true. And and I think we would want to do a hard look at it. Right. Most people that are really in the eclis business and think about closed ecosystems say you want to do both, and it's just a and you know it's just a matter of efficiency. Uh, you'd have to if you will, you'd have a lot of excess hydrogen once you were done, if you put it through all the processes and you're only using hydrogen water for oxygen. So uh, generally, the, the argument is you want to do both. Yeah. And you need you need you need sources of carbon for these reactions anyway, like the methane, right? You got to get it from somewhere. And, and so yeah. it really feels to me and this is sort of a, 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 you know, an impression that I've been getting over time, like on the one hand, you've got folks like Elon Musk saying they're going to want to send spacecraft filled with human beings mm -hmm. to the surface of Mars, roll them out onto the surface and, and it'll be like survivor on the surface of Mars. And then on the other hand, you've got this, this very deliberate, very careful practice of one step at a time, like let's send an instrument to Mars, see if we actually can produce oxygen. I mean, obviously, you proved it in the lab here on Earth, but, but to actually take it, to, you know, with those temperature variations with the weather changes with the, the actual day to day operations, you're learning to operate this thing remotely. And that's like one little piece out of what could be thousands of different engineering solutions to solve the problems in what you what is essentially you're trying to create a closed environment, which we haven't been able to do here on Earth very well. How, how far away do you think that we are to practically sorting out many of the of the engineering challenges to be able to have some kind of sustainable 
existence. Like, you know, I'm imagining McMurdo Base, but on, in mm -hmm. on Mars. Mm -hmm. You know, how many to the nearest order of magnitude do you think of 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 more of these kinds of experiments would you like to run? No, that's an excellent question, and that's the that's the example I've always used. Is is my vision of Mars? You know, I'm not looking at terraforming. That's too many hills. You know, down the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but getting to a stage in McMurdo, where there's scientists that fly in and out every, you know, couple of years, uh, that's a really exciting vision. And that's the point where I can imagine you just send a truck up to the permafrost and fill it up with water and bring it back. You know, once you have that kind of infrastructure, um, you know, the cynical view. When I first got involved in this. Human ex preparing for human exploration. It was in the 90s, probably, and it was probably in 96 that I remember Dan Golden, who was the head of NASA mm -hmm. at the time, saying, 15 years, we may be sending people to Mars. It could be as soon as 15 years, 2011, right? It's Come just, and gone. Hmm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. And the thing is, now they're saying, 15 years, we could be sending humans to Mars. So the cynic would say, you know, 30 years from now, they'll be saying 15 years. I don't think so. I think this time is very different. And there's two things different. Um, one is, of course, the level of investment in MOXIE and other technologies, terrain, relative nav navigation. NASA has really started to invest in a way that, you know, in the past, it was just thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good sign. Um, and maybe more importantly, you mentioned Elon Musk. There's SpaceX. There's, you know, right now when they're China and the UAE and NASA all sent missions to, you know, to Mars this time around. Of course, Europe's done it. Other countries will be doing it. It is really a true international adventure now, not just what it used to be. Well, we'll carry a Italian instrument on our spacecraft. Everyone, a lot more countries are starting to play um, at, at the table. So I think this will happen. So 15 years is reasonable to get a first crew there. Mm -hmm. And then I think I haven't given a lot of thought to how many times that has to happen before you have McMurdo base. It's probably another 15 years. Right. I As mean, for the technology, you know, we can sustain human life in space for the right amount of time. We've done that on the space station. We know that's doable. So, so Mars is like space, but in many ways better in many ways better right i remember long ago hearing a concept that when you think about risks of going to mars mars is the safe haven you want to get out of space real fast and down on the surface of mars should there be any question about what to do in, a, in an emergency get there get on the ground you know it's not earth but it's uh <laughs> you know yeah. it's a lot safer than being in space and i think that you know watching the the, the successful launch and landing of, of SN15 just a couple of days ago, seeing this just monstrous rocket that has the capability of sending potentially 100 tons all the way to Mars yeah. is that's a lot of just redundancy, run, redundant technology dumped out on the surface of Mars for people to be able to to exist in. Well, that's for sure. And I think you know, one, one thing that SpaceX has already accomplished that NASA has long had on its list of things we need to do to get to Mars is learning how to land rockets and then take off with them again, you know, the, of a good, of a decent, of a respectable size. Because, of course, we need to do that in Mars. We have to go both go and return. We don't do that on Earth normally, but now SpaceX has. So they've checked an important box mm -hmm. uh, in, in the technology, you know, the technology manifest that we need. And good luck to them. I hope they persist and I hope they get there. And if they don't, NASA will or some other country will or all of us working together, hopefully, uh, will get there. What would be an important milestone for us to see? I mean, obviously, having a box that makes oxygen on the surface of Mars is a very important milestone because, you know, yeah. that it's like its only job is to prove that human beings can be supported on the surface of Mars, which is kind of exciting. Right. Um, yes. Uh, what would be another really important milestone to watch for in the coming future that would say, okay, this is happening? There have been others, even on, on Perseverance, uh, the, the terrain relative navigation, the ability to land and take off. You know, next is pinpoint landing. This is the first step toward that. This is safe landing. But to do the sorts of things we're talking about, you're going to have to land the astronauts right at the spot mm -hmm. where you built their base, but not so close that they land on top of it, right? <laughs> uh, 
and we should have this, you know, we should be so lucky to have that problem. Um, uh, so I think that would be a big one, uh, precision landing. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, it's what you said before, the first three priorities are power, power, power. And so to move to a stage where we can have enough power to support a human base, I think the rest will follow. Uh, absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, congratulations in in seeing this through and and seeing this this little box of uh, doing this really important job on the surface of Mars. If people want to follow what you're working on and the status, where should they go? Where should they look? I'd say NASA has a, a superb Perseverance website. Everything goes through there. All the data comes out through there as quickly as it can. So I, I would go to NASA first, uh, and there'll be links to other yeah. other sites, local sites. We haven't done a lot yet, specifically for MOXIE. You know, usually the clock starts ticking on that when you actually uh, get down on the ground and it's successful. Uh, so uh, we're just start as i said we're spreading our wings yeah well fantastic uh, very exciting development thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and and i look forward to the uh, the mcmurdo on mars oh so do i and I, you know i hope i mean i'm 68 years old and i certainly hope to live to see yeah the first uh, the first uh, the first woman st- 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 set foot on mars um and uh, i'm certain my children will if i don't Yeah, it's going to be exciting. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Take care. Okay. Take care.